So uh, I suspect this will probably be uh, probably a pretty short episode, but that could be nice for a change because I, I noticed like our old ones when we started doing this thing where we delve into old TV shows and just yammer about them, they were pretty short. We'd, you know, talk for 12, 15 minutes and then end all of our episodes lately are like a freaking hour long of us just yammering about the Old West and stuff. <laughs> but, you know, it's just how it, just how it goes. But I just don't think we'll have as much to say about this because in general, you know, we watch old TV shows, and I kind of think that's one of the sort of neat things about this is, you know, we do a little research into these old shows and where they fit into the pantheon of TV, and just, you know, you learn some facts, you learn some things about the origins of Bonanza or the Waltons or whatever. That's valuable about this little podcast we do, if nothing else is, because then, you know, we talk about what we thought about it, but who the hell are we? Who really cares what we think about these shows? You know, they're like our critiques, it doesn't really matter, so at least... At least there's the, you know, the factoids and stuff that go along with it. Where this week is a bit different, we're going to watch Glass Onion, which is the sequel to Knives Out. Because how this came about, we don't usually watch movies, but we were going on a run of old detective shows. It was like uh, a Nero Wolf show and uh, an unaired Sherlock Holmes pilot from like the 50s. Maybe it was the 40s, it was really old. And then we, then that made me think, like, oh, we should watch the modern version, the the neat, interesting take on where mysteries have come lately. So we watched *Knives Out*, that movie, by uh, Ryan Johnson, and uh, the sequel came out. So, so I just figure, you know, let's watch the sequel. But I did not do any research. I have no factoids. I have no information because I would rather not know. You know, it's more fun to just go in and not know anything, and that's like a little bit hard to do in this modern age. Like uh, people are talking about this thing all over the internet. It's really successful, really popular. But I would see people say like, oh, you, got, you should watch Glass Onion. It's different from the first one, but, and then I'm like, click off. I don't care. Don't tell me. <laughs> like, I don't want to know. So I just want to go into this. All I know is that it's the same character, uh, Benoit Blanc, if you recall, same director. Everybody likes it. So you know, <laughs> but, but I don't know how, again, like in this, so in this case, since I don't have any accompanying information, all this will be is whether we liked it or not. I don't know if anyone will care. If not, you know, hey, see you next week. We'll watch it, an old TV show again and get back to our normal thing. But, okay. All right. Yeah. Like I really do find it's, uh, especially nowadays, I'm sure you're not as aware of this with, the, you know, without keeping up with stuff, but there's like this phenomenon that's been going on for like 10 or so years at least, where even movie trailers give away the whole movie to the point that people complain about it. Like an example is like the stupid Batman versus Superman movie that came out. But there's this, uh, what's the name of the guy who killed Superman in the comics? Uh, Doomsday. They showed in the trailer that Doomsday is in the movie, but he doesn't show up till the very end of the movie. That should have been a surprise. That's the, the final act twist, but they showed in the trailer. They do that enough that people complain about it. They're like, why do you guys in Hollywood keep giving away every movie in the trailer? Enough, there was enough complaints that we got a response. And the response was, when we market test stuff, people prefer. Movies make more money if people, like people are more willing to go to a movie if they know basically what's going to happen. <laughs> they know their, their time is worth it or their money's worth it. Or the way I would look at it is that we're such a milk toast society at this point. We don't even want to be surprised by movies. We just want everything to be comfortable and bland and boring. Yeah, no, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, I would much rather go and see something where I couldn't couldn't guess everything. Yeah, it's such a neat and, and experience. There's a little, and there's a little, like a little something that I never would have thought of in my wildest dreams happens at the end, and I'm like, wow, didn't see that coming. And I have no idea if this movie gives away what it gives away in the trailer, but it's especially important for a mystery. And if you recall, the first one, Knives Out, what was neat about it is it was uh, the, the nurse who was looking after the elderly uh, author, and it appears that he killed himself, but then you find out that she actually accidentally overdosed him, and that happens halfway through the movie. It's not a mystery. Like the, it's a reverse mystery because you do know what happened. But then the rest of the movie is the actual details of what, what fully what that. happens. Yeah. 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 So I assume this is going to be a similarly circuitous, weird, <laughs> complicated thing. So yeah, the less you know, the better. 
but I was just going to say the it's so rare nowadays to to just not know about something. I remember when I was still living in Toronto, so this was five or six years ago, uh, my friend Craig just asked me if I wanted to go see a movie. He had like free passes or something to some movie. So it was such a, a, a rare experience to not know anything. I just went in and sat down. And it was this movie called uh, It Follows that is like a horror movie. And it's just about this monster. Apparently it's based on a dream that the director had where the monster just looks like a normal person. And all it does is it walks at a normal pace toward you. And if it touches you, you die. So it's very, almost like a zombie, not scary, except that it never stops. So while you're asleep, it's still walking toward you and it's going to walk toward you for the rest of your life. <laughs> and, and it was like, whoa, neat, because I never heard of it and I didn't know that's what it was about. So I'm watching this movie and it starts unraveling and I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. But I just know that's the first thing. What I just told you is the first thing someone would tell you about it if, if I had ever heard of it. I was just lucky that I never heard of it. But that was like years ago, and I don't have any other examples since then of that happening. It's just, it's so rare to just not know. So this is pretty close, though. I mean, I guess we know who the main character is. We know he's this detective, but that's it. So uh, this is, this is going to be all right. I think I like uh, And just knowing at least that even if I hadn't heard that people like it, this guy is such a good director, and the first one was so good. You know, it's pretty safe to say. We don't know anything about it except that it's going to be good. <laughs> so okay, well, let's check her out and see how, see if it holds up. Yeah, that's a tricky thing too, right? Is that uh, the first one was, I guess the only thing I know about this is just that in general, because the first one did well, uh, he got signed on to make at least two more. So there should be at least one more after this. And that uh, Netflix bought the rights to this series and it released in theaters really briefly for only like a week or two, but it didn't play here in our podunk town because that's too bad. That would have been neat actually to go to a theater and see it on the big screen. But uh, yeah, it just temporarily was in theaters, but it was Netflix's biggest ever theatrical release. But also, do you remember that back in the day? Like if you didn't see a movie in the theater, it was like a million years until it came out on VHS. You really, you know, you really missed out where nowadays this is almost weird that it took an extra month for it to come out on Netflix because oftentimes, especially the pandemic really nailed this home, but a lot of times now movies come out in theaters and at home on the same day. <laughs> like I'm amazed movie theaters still exist. Nah, I am too. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I do feel like that's one of those things in my lifetime. Like I used to work at a movie theater. I was a projectionist and it took is uh, the uh, Barard Cinema so what was it? It's the Scotiabank Theater now, anyway, on Burrard Street in Vancouver. And it's like the whole block. It's enormous, this place. And you just think of like, if they could turn this into condos and make a zillion dollars. It's just shocking that it that it's still there. <laughs> like in my lifetime, I will not be at all surprised if the switch flips. Because all it's going to take is for real estate developers and stuff to just say, what are we doing here? Why are we these gigantic rooms to try to show movies when it's not, uh, it's not the, you know. And nobody's coming anymore. That's yeah. what it's going to take. Yeah. Just nobody going anymore. Yeah, I mean, I can't and remember And it probably won't time. be the movie theater that does it, and it'll be the prices of the popcorn, the stuff <laughs> at the concession. People won't be able to afford it. That's true, too, because, yeah, if you buy, uh, I, well, also, it's, it's kind of both sides, I guess, where, yeah, it's like if you buy popcorn and two drinks and two things of, uh, you know, chocolate covered raisins, it's easily like 25 bucks. But also the tickets, it's not so much around here, but in like the big cities like Toronto, they were doing anything they could to justify charging more money. So there was the, uh, first it was like just, I don't remember what it was called, but like the extra higher definition sound and higher definition video, that would, they charge a little more for that. Then there was 3D, they tried for a while. I don't know if that's still going. I think the new Avatar movies in 3D, I don't know. But that was like, it was a novelty, but it was kind of neat. It's like, let's bring back the 1950s 3D shit, except better now, but but that cost extra. Then they had the VIP theaters, where like a ticket to see a movie was like 20 or $25. And I did go to it a couple times because, uh, you know, they'd have, on Tuesday, the cheap day, 
the VIP theater costs the same as a normal theater and the normal theater was cheaper. So just to try it, I did go see a movie or two in VIP and it is, it was real good, but that's where you'd get like the reclining chairs and you could buy beer, which cost a million dollars and all this stuff. But yeah, like it's not at all weird to spend a hundred bucks going to the movies now, which is like wild when, when at the same time you can just watch it at home on your amazing TV and make your popcorn in the microwave. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be shocked. Uh, I, that will be probably be one of the last thoughts that'll cross my head when I'm hopefully an old, old man and I'm uh, in some weird, you know, surrounded by nurses just waiting for me to kick off. That'll be one of my last things is like, what's going on with movie theaters? Are they still around? Like, because <laughs> uh, I doubt it. Anyway, that got weirdly morbid. So anyway, <laughs> The Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery just came out and uh, everyone loves it. So let's go. Wow, it's long, 220. But yeah, we'll split this in half. We'll take an intermission halfway through, which is also a thing that they used to do in movies back in the day that I wish yeah. they'd bring back. But that's another benefit to uh, watching things at home, right? We can stop this halfway through, go out for a drive, get something to eat. We don't have to sit here for two and a half hours. I remember one more little story, I guess, since we don't have anything to say about this thing, is, uh, do you remember, did you ever watch those dang Lord of the Rings movies that came out like 15 years ago? Yeah, I watched one. Yeah, where it's like obviously well done, you know, like I don't think you could make a better version of Lord of the Rings, but they're long, boring books. I got halfway through the second book and I, I tapped out. So, of course, they're long, boring movies. And I have a just have to go to the bathroom all the time anyway. So I remember at the second one, I was right in the middle of the theater. Like I would have had to crawl over no matter which way I tried to get out of there, crawl over 15 people. So I just and I just had to pee for like the last hour and 20 minutes of this 60 zillion hour movie and I just remember that there's the Battle of Helm's Deep it was like really cool in a sense because it was like a, a fucking 40 minute battle it was crazy how long this big battle between the elves and the dwarves and the blah 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 but the whole time I was like in pain it was like I was being stabbed in in the in the abdomen by a knitting needle or something you were at battle yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that's that's my eternal memory of that movie is just like just having to pee so bad. And it's like, this is not fun. Also, speaking of Lord of the Rings, because like I got nothing against it, but I just find it weird how nerds of my generation love it so much because it's it's quite bland. The books and I mean, it was kind of the first fantasy thing. So sure. But I don't know why they love it as much as they love it. I, I, I sort of like it, but, you know, I just I don't know why it's so amazing. But that's when I found out, too, because my roommates at the time were all excited and ripped, like, all right, Lord of the Rings, until one of them realized he didn't have any weed left. And he was freaking out, calling all his friends, trying to get weed because he did not want to sit through this Straight. interminable movie without yeah. being stoned. And I was like, aha, <laughs> since I don't do that, now I get it. You're just as bored as me unless you're stoned. And then you can pretend you're amongst the elves. And it doesn't feel like you're sitting there for three hours. And so that really cleared up a lot for me. It's like, yeah, okay, it's not that there's really necessarily anything wrong with me. Everybody thinks this is too long. I'm just hanging out with a bunch of stoner nerds. <laughs> so, all right, enough of my preamble. Glass onion. So uh, I guess we should say first off, uh, we are going to spoil this movie and maybe the previous one. So don't listen to this if you haven't watched these movies. But yeah, I think I'm uh, the most surprised by how much I kind of didn't really like it. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I thought it was... Yeah, because like I was saying... It was boring. I, didn't like any of the characters and it couldn't care less. It was just hoping some of them would get done in. Yeah, so uh, yeah, because again, like just seeing all the reviews and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I am, I'm a little surprised that... Uh, I mean, it wasn't... Well, that seems appropriate. A siren going by. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it's like not awful, but I'd say it's a, a extremely average movie <laughs> where I, I felt like the first one was pretty exceptional. Like I would watch the first one again, and I'm sure I will sometime, but I really can't see watching this one twice. I agree. I would watch the first one anytime. It had enough twists and turns and was keeping you guessing and seemed like, well, like, like a... Like a normal type, normal but 
different uh, mystery. But this was, con I found it was convoluted, contrived, all this technology, which yeah. I mean, was okay, but... That is, yeah, the feeling I got is like this is uh, like if they did a murder mystery in the Jetsons. <laughs> this is how I started to feel when getting into this hydrogen powered energy crystals and yeah, that the whole thing is on this this fancy pants island with all the the technology and stuff and yeah it's just and i couldn't stand any of the characters although i suppose they they wanted you to not like them because you had to believe that they were more interested in their money and their future and it was all tied into the main character there the norton guy yeah, that, that I think is uh, was several things I think about the differences between this one and the first one. But that is certainly one of them. And yeah, like you're saying, I don't know how how to get around that because, yeah, like you're saying, like these people need to be self-serving and self-centered and, you know, uh, weird inflated egos in order to, to toady up to, to uh, Edward Norton's rich guy character. But yeah, it really makes you not like any of them. Yeah. Whereas in the first one, like everyone in the family... They all had, you know, difficult personalities, but they all had different relationships with the grandfather and different... And they seemed like normal enough. They seemed like uh, believable people that you might meet in life so that you didn't know whether they were guilty or not guilty. Uh, and there was still stuff like I'm thinking of like the son in the first one who, uh, you know, he felt left out of the empire because he's not the one who wrote the books. However, he did help his dad with the publishing for decades. So he felt like he, he should be entitled to it, even though technically it wasn't his. So, yeah, you had some kind of balance of like, OK, maybe this guy is overstepping his bounds a little. He's kind of a, a, a tough personality, but you also see his side. Yeah, and, where... and you could see that he had some redeeming features, which is why I, I say they're more, they were more natural because you saw a good side and a bad side to them in this one everybody was kind of flat they yeah. were all self-serving well even uh, i'm sort of surprised even from a writing standpoint because usually this guy ryan johnson does such fancy stuff i was saying how again i didn't know who was in this movie so when i saw dave batista i was like oh cool that guy's a wrestler and i've been a pro wrestling fan forever but he's also excellent he's he's drax in the uh guardians of the galaxy movies he was the best part of the the new Blade Runner movie. Like he's a legitimately really good actor and I've never seen him play a less, like like he was wasted in this movie. He was just playing a dumb wrestler guy, <laughs> you know? So even him, they didn't use him right. And maybe that's true with all of these actors. Yeah, same thing. Okay, Kate Hudson, I say most of the things that I've seen her in, she's that kind of like uh, female, femme fatale kind of type. But she was way over the top but in this way, one. Yeah, yeah, too much, too much too happy too screamy too and i'm sure that 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 woman has uh, in fact i've seen her in things where she has quite good acting skills but they sure weren't put to everybody was flat yeah. one one layer like a caricature but not in a fun way just and, in a lazy way i mean yeah you never saw any redeeming side to anybody or or where you might have said oh gee i thought it might be that person but but hey they're showing this side of them that i don't if it's them you never got to that point and at the very end here they're all self-serving and won't say what they saw and uh, going against the big money man but then when our heroine starts going around smashing everything they all all of a sudden have a switch yeah, like and, what's that all about and talk about too little too late right because they are already if if they didn't know for sure that their friend had been killed by ed norton they were quite sure, at the very least. And then they watched Dave Batista die and be poisoned in front of them. And yeah. none of that was enough? Like, yeah. <laughs> too late. It, it, what does it take? It takes this, this uh, the heroine going around smashing up a bunch of things before they suddenly, and all of them, not just one or two of them, but all of them all at once. Yes, I saw that. And yeah, I saw that. No, it was corny, right? <laughs> real corny. It was like, oh, come on. And uh, and then there's on both sides, I feel like the emotional core 
was lacking. I still liked Benoit Blanc. He's great. Yeah. Daniel Craig did a great job. His yeah. character was good. He was like stuck in a bad movie, but he was fine. Like if they make a third one, I'm still, I would hold out hope. I would still watch it, obviously, because he's really good. He just needs to be in a better mystery. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the, the two sides where I was thinking how the emotional core is missing, this group of these friends I didn't buy that at all. When they're showing the flashbacks to them hanging out in the glass onion and they're all friends. And they're, what a motley crew, though. Look at uh, what fucking bro Dave Batista hanging out with nerdy computer guy hanging out with girl, Kate Hudson. Yeah, and the, it's like, no, no you uh, no, uh, you were not. You were not friends. Why and, are you and, friends? And the gal who's, who's, she just has political ambition. That's yeah. all. That's all she has in life. Yeah, and, and even, it's not like that came along later. Even in those flashbacks, like, uh, one of the first things that uh, that Ed Norton did for her is got her elected to local office. Like this, talk about, it's less than one dimensional. It's like half of a dimension. All she is is a politics person. <laughs> she has no other like personality at all. And then on the other side, I think like kind of the most important part of Knives Out is that you really like the nurse right away. You know, she's just a nice person and the, her relationship with the author guy who, who dies, right away you believe in it. And when the twist happens and you learn that she poisoned or she gave the guy uh, the wrong medicine and overdosed him, you care because you like her and yeah. you don't want bad things to happen to her. Where I didn't even, even the sister who I guess was supposed to be that role in this one, she's all right, I guess. But I didn't really care. Certainly not yeah. enough. Yeah, I didn't like her. And in in the Knives Out one again, even people as simple as the granddaughter in that, they showed both. They just showed a young girl who would do things like sneak out at night and all these things, um, but also had a had sort of a nice side to her. And I'm not saying characters have to have nice sides to them, but most people in life do have. Uh, two sides at least. They they have a side that they show to the public and then they have a private side. We saw none of that in any of these characters. They were all just their public image. I think too the perfect example of that is again in Knives Out is Ransom, the grandson who you find out is actually the one who did it. But you still like him. You still like him because <laughs> yes, because they introduced you to a little bit of why he was like that. And some of why he was like that was his circumstance in life. He, would, he was very privileged and given everything and was not going to get anything at the end. And so that's what I mean when they showed a little bit of character development here. These, everybody was just one-sided. The, the, the politician lady, the, the um, sexy girl who just always danced around and screamed at everything. It, it, very flat. Or even uh, Dave Batista's character, again, like where there was opportunities to make that character more, is that, that archetype that he played I mean, there are people like that that I'm yeah, well aware of. He's just a big buff guy. That's... Right, but specifically that he's the online sort of men's rights activist guy who's talking about, uh, you know, uh, we've gotten away from our primal nature and, you know, men are supposed to be this way and men are supposed to be that way. And it's played for a joke so much that he's got a commandeering mother who <laughs> just yells at him and stuff. And like, yeah, that's a little bit funny, but that's more of an SNL sketch because yeah. in real life, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily like that guy, and you probably wouldn't agree with most of the stuff that he says, but the reason people like him exist, it's the same as why super far-right conservative people exist or super left-wing communist-type people exist, because they are they do have a point. They just overblow it. They take it too far. But all these people have points. Even if you were doing that movie and you said, okay, these are just our supporting people and we are just going to show them at one level and we're not going to do any development as to the kind of people that they were. Your main characters, Blanc, the, the detective, they did develop his character. He really had a lot going for him. Right. But Ed Norton, who was the other main character who they really could have done some development as showing different phases of his personality. Again, his that was a very, very flat role for a guy like that. They could have really done something with that because, I mean, this guy was a guy who was stealing ideas, making money all over the world, knew how to manipulate people, but did he really? <laughs> you know, they, but they, they really didn't develop him. I think he was very 
underused in a role like that. And that's another case where there's so many aspects where I feel like the core of this movie is missing, like the core of their friendship I didn't believe in, the emotional core of the good character just wasn't all the way there. And it was bothering me so much about his company that I went and looked up on the Wikipedia plot summary and still couldn't figure out. The whole thing hinges on the idea, whatever it was, for his company that does whatever it does, crypto kids, whatever, random shit. I, like, they did not seem to explain it. The whole thing hinged on that it wasn't his idea. It was this his girlfriend Andy's idea. But it's an idea that you can sketch on a napkin. You can become Steve Jobs or Elon Musk and take over the world and be the richest guy in the world through an idea on a napkin. And what was the idea? What do they do? I feel like that's important enough to get into. And I, I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, yeah. It went by me too. <laughs> yeah. So, because again, I just feel like it's also, it's like that idea is underdeveloped too, because, you know, any of those people, like, I mean, I think he's obviously supposed to be uh, an Elon Musk, Steve Jobs amalgam that even showed him in like his black shirt, like Steve Jobs' black turtleneck. But those people didn't have an idea that changed the world. They, they you know, it's an array of things. It's nothing you could write on a, a napkin. It's nothing you could attribute to a single person. So I just didn't buy into that either. Like, this is weird. This whole, what is this whole story based on? <laughs> just, and, and, and why, well, I guess the, well, the idea, why was it always just maintained on a napkin? Why weren't there copies? If this thing was so wonderful and so powerful, why weren't there copies of it other places? It reminds me of, there's this Simpsons where Homer's having money problems and he has a dream for this device. And they're like, Mr. Simpson, I can't believe you've invented this device. This is going to revolutionize the world. This is, everyone's going to have three or four of these. This will make you rich and famous forever. But because it's a dream, he can't quite see it. And he's like, sorry, what is the device? And they're like, well, you wouldn't need to see it. You invented it. And they keep not showing it to him. Like, that's what it reminds me of. Like, what is just the mass mystical thing that this company did? You know, because even if you point to like Microsoft, it does a zillion things. Google, it does a zillion things. What is this thing <laughs> that is on the napkin? It's fucking annoying is all, you know, like I could, there's a good and a bad version of, of everything. You could have explained that, but they sure didn't. <laughs> they like deliberately didn't, which bugged me. Um, but yeah, and also just structurally, to take it away from the characters and stuff. In a way, I feel like this movie is a little bit a victim of the previous movie, of being a Knives Out movie. Because it made me think of, you know, that guy M. Night Shyamalan? He did The Sixth Sense, and it was that big ending that uh, you find out Bruce Willis was a ghost the whole time. And it sort of blows your mind. You're like, holy shit. No one ever talked to Bruce Willis. He was a ghost. Cool. But it ruined that guy's career because he then felt like he had to do a twist ending ever since. And he's done like six more movies with twist endings that are way worse. So in a smaller way, I feel like the same thing happened here. Knives Out got famous for halfway through the movie. They change the paradigm. They give you information you didn't have. And in that case, it was that the nurse actually did seemingly commit the crime, then they rewind and you retake the events with this new information. They did that again here, except it was, this isn't really his ex-wife, this is his, this is the ex-wife's twin sister playing a role, and then retake everything. But that's uh, hard to swallow on top of a bunch of events that are also, the whole thing is hard to swallow on every level, so that didn't help, just another layer. And not as interesting, not as believable, and there was no need to do the rewind because the whole first hour of the movie was a big fat load of nothing happening. So if they had just... In fact, remember, I said, my God, I hope they kill somebody soon because I'm pretty bored with this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, it, they should And then they did. They, they did in that Duke guy. <laughs> I, I feel like you could re-edit this movie and make it significantly shorter and not do the switcheroo. Just from the start, let us know this is... The, the twin sister and then you wouldn't have to retell the whole thing it certainly it was just not nearly interesting enough to merit re going over the same yeah you know, i agree and uh and yeah just like there's just there's just no level at which this felt believable like you've already got benoit blanc 
the most famous detective in the world, but at least they make a bit of a joke of it. Like I Googled you and Google said you were the most famous detective in the world. But I think you can have one guy be the, the most blank in the world. Then you've got the richest tech guy in the world also. And it's like, no, you, no, you just don't. You just, where do you go from here? He's already done a murder mystery with the richest, most famous man in the world. Before it was just a famous author. That's such lower stakes, so much lower. This is Jetson Island. <laughs> like, it's just way too much. Like, yeah, that's what this feels like. This feels like the tenth one of these movies when they're out of ideas. And it's only the second one. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's not what I expected to happen. Uh, I mean, well, me either, especially when you told me that there were so many great reviews of it. I was thinking, okay, I, you know, go in with eyes wide open expecting to see some really good characterization plot development but but i mean even that the ending there it, well as we said it was so corny where they all had an about face and they were all going to turn against him now that he was down i mean not a one of them held back i mean i mean that's like real tv stuff and I'm sure there are things, you know, if I watched it again or if I dug into, you know, all the little trivia on the IMDb page or whatever, I'm sure there are a lot of things and little references and stuff, but they also didn't feel particularly earned in this. It really just felt set up. Like, just so you can have your clever line at the end about how, oh, you always wanted to be known in the same breath as the Mona Lisa. Well, now you are because you're, the Mona Lisa was destroyed on your watch. But to set that up, you have to say it a bunch of times mid as you're on the way through the movie. It's it just it just makes it all feel phony. It doesn't feel. Uh, yeah, and they had to drop all kinds of little references. Like there was one reference there about Anderson Cooper's party or retirement farewell or something, whatever it was. Uh, and they dropped other names throughout like that. And I thought, oh, I don't know, is that really adding anything? To this movie? Um, yeah, just uh, he's rich, he's well connected, he's famous, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I don't explaining know. to us all, you know, all the technical stuff uh, in the first hour about all these wonderful things that were on his island. Um, okay, uh, do that if you want, but how did that tie into why he was any more famous than anybody else and, and going to control the world any more than anybody else. All kinds of people have that kind of technology at their fingertips. <laughs> you know, this also reminds me of yeah, him just being this, you know, Elon Musk surrogate. <laughs> there was a, an episode of The Simpsons where Homer becomes a boxer and uh, he gets challenged to uh, fight the heavyweight champion of the world. So this guy, this Don King guy, <laughs> shows up and is like, oh, Homer Simpson, you know, we blah, 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 let's set up a fight. And they're like, wow, that's Lucius Tate. He's exactly as rich and as famous as Don King, and he looks just like him, too. <laughs> like, yeah, like, this movie just, it all felt uh, artificial. Like, it's that, that thing And where... that whole thing at the beginning of uh, playing up to the pandemic stuff. Um, because then they just dropped that completely. Whatever it was they shot in people's mouths, which supposedly made them virus-free... Then the pandemic, well, if it was mentioned again, it was yeah, just I mean, in passing. I guess just supposed to be another another example of how rich and famous this guy is or how powerful he is that he has the pandemic thing. But even that, yet another case of just like, well, I don't believe that because we lived through the real world and nobody had that. You know, <laughs> like it's just another thing I don't believe in. Like this could have been taking place, like the way it took place on Super Technology Island, it could have been... Uh, rainbow gumdrop land it could have been like he time traveled back to medieval england like it doesn't it's just a setting that is not believable where the house in the first one you could totally believe that a guy who writes mysteries and is pretty famous and successful and can afford this house would have this house and would make the house look that way and then you got the additional metaphor of it's like a game of clue you're in the big house and it's got all the cool accoutrements around and yeah just just everything in the first one felt so much the, the least believable thing about the first one was benoit blanc because he's this weird southern gentleman who's the best <laughs> detective in the world all you had to buy is that daniel craig is the best detective in the world and everything else was very believable where in this one nothing was believable like you're just having to swallow weird thing after weird thing oh and then yeah once they doubled back and revealed that the sister the the ex-wife is really the twin sister man the number of coincidences involved in her skulking about 
the island and overhearing things and being at just the right place at just the right time where have you ever tried to sneak in real life? It's impossible. People have peripheral vision. Everyone sees you. You cannot be stealthy. It's impossible. <laughs> nobody, nobody even came close to suspecting somebody was on their trail, her, except Duke, who had heard a branch crack or something and turned, and she was gone by that time. She was a freaking grade three school teacher from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and yet she has all these sleuthing skills. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she should have been significantly more bumbling. I kind of did like that they explained her... Uh, her big filibuster moment by her just being drunk. So she was doing weird stuff that she wouldn't normally do. I was like, all right, I'll buy that. <laughs> but not really the rest of it. And uh, I guess that's, I guess that's it. <laughs> I guess <I'm... laughs> but yeah, no, if anything, I actually thought because we took a little break after the first hour, but it was still going okay. It was a little slow to get started, but I was like, I was kind of thinking like, we don't necessarily need to, you know, we could just skip this week because if we just watch it and it's a nice, nice movie and we just like it and we have nothing to say about it, maybe I won't bother putting out the podcast. So the, <laughs> so the upside and downside to this is I didn't expect to not like it as much as I didn't like it, but at least it gave us something to talk about <laughs> because like, I feel like, yeah, the world at large, this will probably be another, if anybody even gives a shit about this episode, you know, nobody likes it when we don't like the thing they like. It's always negative comment time. How dare you say this about X, Y, or Z? And I mean, but I can't help it. We're not, it's, this is not performative. We were just sitting here waiting for it to end. That's not my fucking fault. That's your fault, Ryan Johnson. What was that movie? That was way worse than the first one. Oh, like the first movie was definitely, uh, I would recommend anybody. Yeah. See it. See it again. Is that it has an, even though you know the ending of it, that first movie had enough going on in it that you, I, I, I would watch that a second time. I would watch it a third time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure every time I watched it, I would get a little more out of it. This one, I just wouldn't bother. Isn't that weird, too? That's like an extra testament to how good the first one was. Sometimes when you see a bad sequel, again, this wasn't like terrible, but a very average sequel it kind of turned you off of the whole franchise, but this is just making me think like, yeah, that first one was real good. Yeah. What a good movie. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was excellent, excellent. And to me, a sign of a really good movie is when you get to the end of it and you say to yourself, yeah, I would watch that again. Or, the, or there were things I know I missed in it. So yeah, I'd like to see what was it that I wasn't paying attention to, but it was so good that yeah, I want to jump right in there and, and watch it not years from now, but again, immediately, and see what I missed. This one, no, 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 no interest at all in ever watching that again. Not even bits of it or an edited version of it. Like, Yeah, there was like very small moments that I liked. I liked, uh, you know, when the lady's trying to play dead and she used hot sauce as fake blood and the hot sauce is running down her. Because <laughs> like, man, anytime yeah, like you get any of that stuff near your face in any way, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, tiny moments that are like, ah, that's pretty funny. But uh, yeah, I do kind of hope because, again, I'm quite sure there's at least one more in the pipeline. Uh, I guess if for some bizarre reason Ryan Johnson ever hears this, my, my advice would be bring it down to earth. Bring it way down. Make the next one way smaller and no fucking... Well, that's the thing, that too, like they always say about technology. When technology gets, you know, high tech enough, it's indistinguishable from magic, you know? Like if you showed our cell phones to people from the past, or you can just like bring up any YouTube video at any time, it's like magic. And that's what that was like. You know, they pushed the tech a little further than, than what we really have. So it just feels like he's on magical island. And that's not where I want to see a murder mystery happen. That's fucking weird and hard yeah, to it's swallow. It's almost like that overpowered the plot line. Yeah. So I guess uh, the last thing just before, before we sign off for this week is... Uh, one thing I did think was kind of funny that's just a meta thing, nothing to do specifically with this movie, but because Ed Norton was the guy in this, and he was also the dude in Fight Club, a far better film. And there's this line from Fight Club, and not in this specific movie, but they did these uh, promos, you know, like promotional little clips for the movie. And Fight Club's all about weird uh, countercultural, like starting weird groups to fight against society and the government. Pretty, pretty weird movie. <laughs> it's like the, you know... 
like how do you I, I, there's no no point in even trying to describe fight club but one of the lines that norton had is burn down the museums wipe your ass with the mona lisa then at least god will know your name <laughs> and i'm like hey finally in this movie fuck the mona lisa <laughs> got burned to death i always like that line because i don't care about art and i don't care about trying to maintain these things like Maybe you shouldn't deliberately burn the Mona Lisa, but I don't give a fuck about <laughs> things like that. So, I don't know. I just thought that was kind of interesting to see all these years later. Like, hey, he's weird. The same guy is in a movie where the Mona Lisa finally got destroyed. They finally did in this movie what he failed to do in Fight Club. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. So anyway, yeah, next week we'll go back to uh, watching TV shows and uh, delving into TV's past. Again, you know, this was unusual for us, but... But I felt like, you know, we had to do it because Knives Out was so good. But, man, I, I, I yeah. don't know. Follow-up didn't quite cut it for me. Yeah, it is weird, too. I mean, like, I feel like this is, uh, this happens to me quite a bit these days. And it's, it's a little unfortunate because I have hit the point where I don't trust people anymore about TV shows or about video games or about movies because, yeah, like, it doesn't matter. The consensus, you, you just can never trust it. Because I, I didn't hear a single bad thing about this, and it's so clearly not as good <laughs> as the first one. So it's just, oh well, I guess you just got to find out for yourself, and uh, and we did. So, uh, all right, uh, sorry for all the Glass Onion fans. I know you're angry. Try to resist typing a comment on YouTube because there's no point. No one's going to listen. No one cares. <laughs> no one cares what we think either. I'm rambling at this point. All right. Uh, and on that note, it's December 31st, 2022. So happy new year. Happy new year. Yeah. I mean, this won't come out for a few days, but uh, hey, if you time travel back in time, happy new year. But that, that, <laughs> that sets the time that we're at right now. Yeah. The day we watched it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah that's a good example, though. I, I bet that's not going to happen. Like, I can tell you what I did New Year's Eve 1999. A few years from now, I doubt we'll be reminiscing like, hey, you remember New Year's 2022? We watched that boring movie. <laughs> this will evaporate from our minds in three, two, one, gone. <laughs>